So it's new Galaxy time, and a lot of what you see online, especially for enthusiasts, is that these are iterative phones. Samsung is coasting. This will be a boring year for the Galaxy S. And I can kind of see where they're coming from, especially since the Ultra looks almost unchanged this year, at least from the outside. For what it's worth, I don't think these are boring phones. They're likely to be among the best you can buy this year. But the reasons to care about them don't really have anything to do with the way they look on the outside. So let me explain. Take a sec to subscribe and we'll dive into what you need to know about the Galaxy S23, S23 Plus and S23 Ultra. So once again, three galaxies and three display sizes, 6.1, 6.6 and 6.8 inch screens in the regular S23, the Plus and the Ultra. The S23 and Plus still look pretty minimalist, sleek and flat, though in a new palette of colours that, like last year, is fairly subdued, you've got black, cream, green and lavender. Like last year, Samsung.com will also have its own selection of exclusive colours, lime, graphite, sky blue and red, but we haven't had a chance to see those at the time we're recording this. The S23 Ultra, of course, remains your big, beastly Galaxy Note in all but name. And this time it's even more angular with reduced curvature on the display and sidewalls for easier grip. It's a subtle change that's more noticeable in real life when you actually hold the phone and definitely makes the Ultra a bit more distinct from the other two. We shouldn't gloss over the smaller phones though, they lose the wedge-shaped camera bump this year giving all three devices a uniform appearance from the back. It's definitely a minimalist look, especially compared to some of the competition, and both are still more hand and pocket friendly than the aggressively angular Ultra. These two also have bigger batteries, a very welcome change, especially for the standard S23, an extra 200 milliamp hours bringing them up to 3900 and 4700 respectively. And this, combined with the bumper to a Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, should make a noticeable difference to longevity. Actually, I have to immediately jump in and correct myself here because this isn't just any Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, this is the Qualcomm Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 mobile platform for Galaxy. As well as a whopping 16 syllables, this chip runs at a higher clock speed than the regular 8 Gen 2. It's reportedly made by Samsung Foundry as opposed to TSMC, which makes all the others. Whether this will make any practical difference compared to phones like the OnePlus 11, which uses the not-for-Galaxy version of this chip, is unlikely, but it does give Samsung the bragging rights of technically having a faster chip than everyone else. And if the S23's processor is anywhere near as efficient as the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2's we've seen in some Chinese phones recently, this is a big deal for battery life, especially compared to the 8 Gen 1, and especially compared to the Exynos 2200 used in Europe and some other territories. We know this chip is not only fast, but easy on the battery. Besides which, the upgraded silicon enables 8K video at 30fps across all three phones, whereas before it was capped at 24. I still think 8K on a phone is total overkill, but this is one area where the chip does make a tangible difference, especially since the only camera hardware upgrade in the smaller S23s is a bump to 12 megapixels for the selfie camera. The Ultra, on the other hand, has gotten one big camera upgrade in the form of a new 200 megapixel sensor, now combining 16 pixels into one for improved low light performance. The new Samsung HP2 sensor is slightly larger than the HM2 in last year's phone, but the size difference isn't the only thing that matters here. Having more data points also helps with autofocus, so the S23 Ultra should be quicker in this area too. That's all helped along by wider angle OIS, 3 degrees versus 1.5 degrees on the S22 Ultra for improved stabilization. And Samsung's also talking up its improved VDIS video stabilization and AI noise reduction for video thanks to that new Snapdragon chip, but we'll have to wait and see what kind of difference that actually makes. Meanwhile, there are new toys to play with in the camera app, including a dual exposure mode that lets you quickly snap photos and then combine them. And the S23 is also matching one pretty neat camera feature that'll be familiar to Google Pixel lovers. Astro Hyperlapse is Samsung's version of astrophotography, where you can capture details in the landscape and the cosmos at the same time. And there's even a constellation guide built in, which is pretty neat. Expert Roy is back and now lives within the main camera app, with a 50 megapixel mode that gives you all the control you could wish for now at a higher resolution. Despite the lack of changes to the ultra-wide or telephoto camera hardware, the S23 Ultra is still likely to be one of the best camera phones of 2023, especially for telephoto. Samsung still crushes it in zoom shots, and I was really impressed with the results around 30 times, which anecdotally seemed a little bit better than what I get out of the S22 Ultra at that level. Maybe that's due to more data from the main sensor or just improved processing. On the software side, Samsung's One UI is now up to version 5.1, with just a handful of changes compared to 5.0 as exists right now on phones like the S22. There's a new feature where the display can be adjusted for three kinds of lighting conditions, an intermediate level with moderate lighting as well as modes of very dark or very bright environments. In bright sunlight, for example, it'll boost the shadows so they're more visible, and in very dark conditions, it'll lower the highlights for a more comfortable viewing experience. Meanwhile, the advanced eye comfort feature can tweak individual colors to avoid eye strain. Bixby Text Calling now supports English, letting you type answers to your calls when you're not able to speak. This was announced last year, but until now is only available in Korean. And there's a new collaborative mode for Samsung Notes as well, powered by Google, though we didn't have a chance to demo this. 
So these phones, and the smaller S23s in particular, are fairly conservative upgrades from last year's models. For the Ultra, it's still all about that camera and the S Pen and the giant screen, those standout features that define a Samsung flagship. But the big thing to watch out for across all three, I think, is going to be battery life. That used to be a hallmark feature of the Note series, but has fallen by the wayside in recent years. Battery life in general could be the one area where, thanks to the new SLC and the bigger battery for the two smaller models, we see significant year-on-year -year improvements. And particularly if you're coming from an S20 or an S21, that could be the kind of thing that justifies an upgrade. And that question of whether an upgrade is worth it is one we won't really have the answer to until Samsung unveils its trade-in deals. Historically, these have been pretty generous to the point where maybe it is worth paying a few hundred dollars even if you are relatively happy with your current phone. So is the S23 Ultra a boring upgrade or the best Android phone? Well, it could turn out to be both. The fact that S22 and S21 owners may want to skip this one just speaks to how competitive those phones were and still are. Sometimes an incremental upgrade is what's needed, just ask anyone who's ever upgraded an iPhone. For me personally, if I had an S21 Ultra and Samsung's trade-in deals were as generous as they've been previously, I probably would jump on it and the reason mainly would be battery life and camera. But if I had an S21 Ultra here in the UK, it'd be the Exynos version, which is less efficient and had worse battery life than the Snapdragon variant. So if you're an enthusiast in this part of the world, knowing the reputation Exynos has, and knowing that now finally you can buy the Snapdragon version, maybe you're more likely to part with your cash. I get the criticism a lot of people have over this being an iterative update, but I think these phones are more than enough for this year. At the same time though, I think next year will be due a bigger shakeup of the Galaxy S line, the kind of change we saw going from S7 to S8 or S10 to S20. That's especially true for markets outside the US where we have models with things like ultra fast charging and under display cameras. The Galaxy S23 series is competitive enough for now. We'll dig deeper in our full review, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss that, and we'll have comparisons lined up against all the usual suspects. But in the meantime, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.